Okay. Uh, so I'll assume that you can see my screen. Um, thank you. Uh, it's it's a pleasure to be to be back. Um, Today, I would like to focus on uh, the role of humans in ecosystems and how we can um, understand that from, from reconstructing past systems. Um, and so I'm gonna spend part of the talk today focusing in general, um, really, well, more, more specifically to the Pleistocene um, with respect to the Pleistocene extinctions, and then focus in on a particular system that I've worked on in Egypt. Um, so that's, uh, that's kind of the, the roadmap for today. Okay, so the effects of humans on ecosystems. Uh, we've, around, we've been around for a while. Um, the human species for 150, 200, 250,000 years, depending on where you make that break point. Um, and of course our relatives, um, uh, we have been around much longer. Uh, I like to think of the process uh, of our involvement in systems as a continuum, uh, because it has been. And our role in ecosystems has likely changed over the last uh, you know, 5 million years or so. Um, that we, we began to diversify uh, into different species. And then of course, uh, throughout um, our history as, as Homo sapiens. Um, I'm really gonna, even though I'm showing uh, our, an our ancestors or uh, close cousins, um, I'm really gonna be focusing on, on humans in, uh, specifically. So let's start uh, more recently uh, than, than what is shown on the last slide and think about the Pleistocene extinctions. This is um, a, a period of time where, where we've come to understand the role of humans uh, much better in the last uh, number of years. Um, but this is a period of time where we had a large influence on, on the global diversity especially of mammals. And I'm gonna focus a lot on mammals today, specifically larger bodied mammals, um, greater than four kilograms. So uh, this graphic, let me walk you through it a little bit. It shows a lot of information and it might be a little outdated. It's from 2006 and there's been a lot of work. This is a really quickly developing field. Um, but what we're showing of, of course are different continents and the numbers and pictographs of, of uh, species uh, relate to the number of extinctions. Uh, that these different continents experienced as humans uh, colonized them. Uh, the black bar represents uh, when humans kind of showed up on the scene. Of course, in Africa, we've been on the scene for a very long time um, before we were Homo sapiens. Um, and uh, as we colonized the planet, um, we see a series of extinctions that we collectively call the Pleistocene extinctions. Some of these are very well timed with human arrival um, and some of them are less well understood. Uh, so um, in Europe, for example, there's fewer extinctions and our arrival is likely um, much earlier than the extinction than, than we have evidence for the extinctions being. Uh, the circles represent uh, evidence for extinctions. Uh, yellow is provisional evidence, green is robust evidence, and we have really robust evidence that around 14,000 years before present, humans showed up a lot earlier before that. So it's not as clear in Europe uh, what's going on. In Australia, it's very, very, um, well, I, I guess I could say clear, um, I, I, or, or maybe to be a little more careful, um, correlated, <laughs> uh, where humans arrive right as we find evidence uh, for mass extinctions in Australia. And that's around, you know, 72 to 44,000 years before present. Uh, in North America, it's also very correlated, um, uh, to, to use a, a more diplomatic uh, term, um, where there's a large number of extinctions um, that we have evidence for right around the time that, that humans arrive on the scene. In South America, there's also a large number of extinctions, but it's less well understood. So humans appear to, to our understanding, uh, humans appear to have played a large role in the Pleistocene extinctions across the planet. Uh, so what can we learn um, when we, we, we get down to business and we want to reconstruct how these ecosystems function before and after uh, human arrival? Uh, and so that's really the goal today, um, to, to reconstruct patterns of interaction, to understand the role of humans uh, on community dynamics over this period of time. Uh, what I'm showing on the right is, is an American lion skull. Lions are an interesting example of uh, what occurred at the Pleistocene boundary. Um, lions were one of maybe the most widespread large mammalian carnivore on land. Um, they were successful in many, many different continents. Uh, they were all over North America. The North, North American lion was actually had larger body size than, than the modern African lion, which is interesting to, to imagine. 
Um, and, and now, of course, their range is restricted to sub-Saharan Africa and a small population in India. And I want to focus a little bit more on how we go about reconstructing interactions um, in, in this particular way, um, because I'm a little more involved in this style of research. And really, the idea here is to take advantage of modern contemporary systems um, to understand the rules of interaction. So, so we'll use the Serengeti rules to kind of quote the documentary film and, and book <laughs> on, on ecosystem processes. Um, and use body size uh, from contemporary systems as a window into what likely occurred in past communities, how past communities were arranged. Um, I'm showing one of my two favorite graphics here, figures from a, from a paper uh, published, um, uh, it's covered up by the window here, uh, in, in, in the 2000s <laughs> by uh, uh, Anthony Sinclair and, and Justin Brashares and, and Simon Maduma. Um, on patterns of predation and a diverse predator prey system. So this is in the Serengeti. And what you're looking at is on the y-axis is uh, mammalian predators uh, arranged by their body size. So the smaller bodied are on the top and the larger bodied is on the bottom. Of course, lions at 150 kilograms are the largest uh, terrestrial carnivores in, in, um, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Um, you know, if we throw in like crocodiles, they, they might not be, but we'll, we'll just focus on the, on the grasslands and the savanna. Um, and what we see is uh, on the x-axis is, is the prey weight range in kilograms. So this is their food. Um, and of course, as we go from the smaller carnivores to the larger carnivores, they're eating larger food. They're, they're eating bigger food, right? They're eating or, uh, herbivores that are larger and that makes sense. But the other key thing to see here is the, is the range. Um, and that's what's highlighted by that black bar. So as we get to larger carnivores, they're eating larger ranges in addition to the larger body size, uh, the mean. Uh, and it would be nice to see distributions on these bars, but um, I guess you wanna plan your publication strategy. You don't wanna throw it all in, in, into one go um, because I think the data are out there. Uh, so, so, so lions have this huge range of food that they eat. Um, you can see one of the interesting things here is wild dogs, they have this like shifted range relative to their body size. They're, so they're uh, eating above their weight. Um, and, and that's because they're such efficient pack hunters. So that's a, a pack hunting signal. Um, so, but it's a nested relationship. So the diets of smaller predators are subsets of the diets of larger predators. Now this means that if you're small, if you're a small herbivore, and you live in the savanna, uh, you're, you're, you're going to be eaten. Um, and that's shown on the bottom graph. Uh, you're, you're somewhat doomed. That's your, that's your future is to be food. Um, uh, and only if you're larger do you escape predation. So in the bottom graph, which is really striking, is uh, the percent of mortality due to predation on the y-axis. And on the x-axis is the log prey, um, uh, log herbivore weight. I have to move around my little zoom bar that's in my way. Um, and what we see is this very sharp sigmoidal uh, kind of switch here, uh, where bef below 310 kilograms, you're, you're, you're doomed. Uh, and above 310 kilograms, you've effectively escaped predation for the most part. And the dividing line appears to be zebra and buffalo. So the Z stands for zebra, uh, wildebeest, um, they're, they're eaten, uh, buffalo, and upwards, you escape predation. So buffalo, giraffe, rhinos, hippos, elephants, a very small percentage of their population is actively killed. Uh, we're not counting scavenging here. Okay, so bottom line, body size really matters in these terrestrial systems, in these mammalian systems. And we can really think of Sub-Saharan Africa um, as, as being a remnant of the Pleistocene. It's kind of one of the last surviving Pleistocene systems uh, for us to, to draw inference from and um, correlate our understanding of these systems to the past, especially a relatively recent past like the Pleistocene. Uh, organisms, were not, it's not like we're going back to the dinosaur world and, and trying to reconstruct uh, which dinosaurs ate whom. Um, you know, this is a little closer in time, so, so we can more confidently make uh, relation, relationships between what we see today and what we saw back, back then. Oh yeah. Okay. So this is how we're currently doing this. Um, and it's based on a, a method uh, published by Rudolf Rohr 
I think in 2010 in American Naturalist, uh, where he establishes a, a logit function um, where uh, the log of the ratio of the probability that there is an interaction between a pre uh, predator and prey divided by the probability that there is not an interaction between predator and prey is a function of the mass ratio between predators and prey. So here M sub i is the mass of a predator and M sub j is mass of a potential prey. Um, and you can see that there's three different terms here, um, one of which is squared and one is linear and one is constant. Um, and this allows, and, and by fitting alpha, beta, and gamma, which are unknown parameters that need to be fit to a particular system, by fitting these parameters, uh, we can establish a Gaussian like distribution in log space that defines the probability of a link existing between a predator and a prey as a function of the predator and prey's body mass uh, in this case. So for example, by fitting, and, and this is, you know, uh, fitting these uh, three parameters uh, could be done by, by a, a, you know, any, any, any kind of, um, you know, simulated annealing or an elder mead, um, uh, you know, algorithm. Uh, so by fitting these parameters, for example, in the Serengeti, in the known Serengeti system, uh, we can accurately predict 74% uh, of link presence as well as link absence. Um, and what I'm showing on the bottom here is not the Serengeti. Uh, it's the one that I had on hand when I was making my talk uh, because I'm wor working on some ocean systems right now. But this is the Benguela system. This is from the famous uh, paper by uh, Peter Yodzis. Um, and it uh, shows uh, predators and prey uh, or, or species arrayed by their body size. Um, and the known trophic interactions being the darker colors, the darker squares in this adjacency matrix and the predicted probability of an interaction overlay on top uh, in the color. So by feeding in a known adjacency matrix, we can fit these unknown parameters, alpha, beta, gamma, and um, derive a, a uh, equation that tells us uh, the most likely, you know, the, the probability of an interaction given body size ratios. Um, so by looking at the Serengeti, which I'm showing on the bottom, and, and for some strange reason, uh, I've put large herbivores on the left and small herbivores on the right. Um, my apologies. <laughs> I tried to switch it around, but it wouldn't let me. Um, uh, it's a detail. Uh, and uh, what we see is um, by looking at the uh, probability of an interaction or an established interaction in modern systems, uh, we can equate that to the likely interaction uh, structure for past systems, assuming body size rules um, stand. Okay, and, and there's not really uh, a whole lot of evidence to suggest that uh, past systems wouldn't be following the same allometric principles as modern systems, especially if we're, we're within the same uh, kind of families of organisms. But that's an assumption. Okay, so let me see if I can pull up my chat window just in case. Okay. All right. So not only do we get uh, mean probabilities. Um, well, this is just kind of showing a, a different cross section, right? So so here on the on the bottom left. Now I'm looking at uh, we have the probability of an interaction on the y-axis, and this is the mass ratio um, on the on the uh, on the x-axis, and so we, you can see this. This isn't logged. The x rate, the x-axis isn't logged, so it doesn't look Gaussian, but but it is um, if you log it. And uh, this just shows that um, for a given predator and prey, let's say if we keep the predator uh, mass constant and we're moving the prey um, mass, there's uh, a prey mass where the prey is too small for the predator. Uh, so you're, it's energetically inefficient for a lion to run around trying to catch mice. Um, but then it's also energetically inefficient and uh, <laughs> risks death uh, to go after the largest animals as well. So there's these boundaries on either side. And this is what this is capturing, where those boundaries change as a function of what the organism size is, the consumer size is. Okay, so not to belabor, oh yeah. And then <laughs> I always say not to belabor the point, and then I belabor it. Uh, but then when we expand this, uh, looking at prey mass by predator mass, we can picture this in, in, in two dimensions and you can see how 
um, the probability of a link is, is changing and captures that nested uh, relationship that we see uh, in the Serengeti. So this is one of the important things that this is capturing. Now, the, the original Ruhr model also allows for latent traits, so traits not associated with body size. So, you know, thinking about marine systems, what, you know, uh, sperm whales, or not sperm whales, that's a bad example, um, but humpback whales are, are not going to obey this, this relationship uh, because they're, they're going after really small things and they happen to be really, really big. Um, and, and so there are other latent traits that are not body size related that you could account for uh, using this, this type of approach as well that I'm not going to go into. Okay. So the questions that we want to address here is how do changes in structure translate to dynamics? So if we take modern Serengeti systems as kind of the baseline and use it to reconstruct Pleistocene systems uh, to get the structure of interactions, and really these are probabilities of interactions. So when I say reconstruct a Pleistocene system, I'm really talking about a large number of potential systems that fit those probabilities. Um, are there differences from one Pleistocene system to another? Uh, so this is really, awesome work um, uh, led by Matias uh, Perez um, in, in 2015 in Proceedings of the Royal Society B. I really like this paper, um, where they, they, they Im implement this method, they, they reconstruct structure and um, using body mass ratios, and then just look at the structure of the system. They look at modularity by nestedness um, to see if there are differences between continents, uh, Pleistocene systems from North America, South America, and Africa. And what they find is that there are large differences um, from one system to another, um, but it doesn't always divide out by, by continent. Uh, so for example, in South American system, there's a large range of modularity predicted by this approach um, and a relatively constrained amount of nestedness that's predicted by this approach as well in all places. Uh, in North America, uh, there, there, there's more modularity than um, in, in some of the Pleistocene systems than is seen in some of the Pleistocene systems from South America. And then Africa kind of falls in the middle here. It's, it's in mid range and that's, that's represented by this. I'm pointing at my screen like you can see that but I should use my pointer, I guess. Um, so African systems fall, fall here somewhere. But uh, Machias uh, and his group went uh, one step further and they asked, well, since we uh, can estimate the structure of these Pleistocene systems, can we assume some very simple dynamics and put those dynamics on that structure? So they used a lack of Altera framework uh, with allometric vital rates. Okay, so I'm just showing the very basic framework that they used, uh, R sub i. And so this is you know the change in uh, abundance um, for species i over time. And R sub i is, is positive it's, if it's an herbivore, negative if it's a carnivore. Uh, to capture that difference in, in growth and mortality. And um, in, in addition to the, the uh, consumption of different prey species. And um, R is assumed to be uh, an allometric, so it's scaled allometrically uh, to mass to the negative one quarter. And um, this term B sub I J is, is extrapolated from these probabilities of a link existing between species. Okay, and um, you know, the system, uh, it's a, you know, high dimensional ODE system uh, is stable if, if the uh, leading eigenvalue is less than zero. And what they experimented with is simulating the system, the Pleistocene system as is, and with the presence of an added apex predator. So they did it without humans, and then they included humans, and they assumed humans had a similar um, hunting behavior or hunting focus as other apex predators in the system. So as, for example, uh, a large uh, lion or a saber-toothed cat. Um, and there is a lot of evidence to suggest that humans were consuming at the top of the food web in the Pleistocene. Um, and by looking at the system without humans and with the added effect of humans, they could assess the destabilizing effect of humans. Okay. So this is what they found. So on the so on the top, I'm just showing the structure as before. On the bottom, uh, the y-axis is the destabilizing destabilizing effect of humans, and we have the different systems uh, across continents uh, according to the colors uh, coded to the key on the left. And what we see is that in North America and South America, humans had a much larger destabilizing effect on the system, whereas in Africa they had a much smaller destabilizing effect. Okay. 
And this is suggestive that because, well, the idea here is that humans evolved in Africa uh, and they involved, they co-evolved with African systems. Um, and it's possible that African systems as we know them are to some extent a product of those interactions. So the, um, the organisms that are present in African systems and the interactions that they uh, have within themselves are um, a consequence of interacting with humans, uh, in particular over the last 200,000 years or so. Um, and this may um, explain to some extent why there are, have been so few documented Pleistocene extinctions in Africa relative to North America or South America where humans were brand new on the scene. So those communities had no um, preparation uh, for, for the arrival of humans. Uh, and that could explain the destabilizing effects that we observe um, when applying this type of theory to those communities. Um, just a very brief mention. So we're applying some of these same approaches to understand uh, the, the change in the Northwest Atlantic uh, over time. We're specifically focusing on the Nova Scotian cell, uh, shelf here. Um, and that's, that's circled uh, in the map. Uh, and, and thinking about how that system might have changed over the course of the Holocene. Uh, of course, that system began as a subarctic uh, kind of icy environment um, and is now not. <laughs> uh, in addition, uh, human fishing has been a huge uh, stressor on that system for hundreds of years. Um, and we wanted to understand how that system may have changed as species were lost. Uh, and we're using the same types of approaches here. I'm just showing the same Benguela food web adjacency matrix that we're using um, as one of the food webs that we're characterizing the probability of, of links occurring between species. Um, one of the challenges we've been having is many of the species in the systems that we're trying to parameterize, the contemporary systems that we're using as a baseline for this, uh, it's very hard to find mass estimates if you're trying to do, to do a complete system, you know, like what's a mass of a jellyfish. Um, so so we, we, we think so far, it looks like these estimates work for length as well. So we could use, and that makes sense because it's, it's a ratio anyway. So it, it's really uh, whatever the, the organism is queuing off of to make its foraging decisions is what's important for this type of um, uh, procedure. Um, and just to give you a sense, uh, this is what the North Atlantic, Northwest Atlantic looks like today. We have um, some very charismatic species like the Greenland shark, which is one of the oldest organisms, possible uh, animals in the world. Um, we have poor beagle sharks, uh, blue sharks, uh, haddock, shrimp, kaplan, all these interesting organisms. Um, and this is what it looked like uh, historically in the 1700, it was very different. I've circled the organisms that are no longer large players in the system or extinct locally. Uh, we have Atlantic system, coastal sharks, white sharks, killer whales, walrus, cod, um, all of whose populations have uh, either collapsed or uh, gone away in the system that we're looking at. Um, and so there's large structural difference between these systems and we expect that there's gonna be large dynamic differences as well. What's interesting is you know, all of the fishing and managerial decisions that we make in, modern, in the modern um, system here, the, the Northwest Atlantic are, are basically working under the assumption that this is, this is the system as it should exist. Uh, whereas very recently it was very different. So the managing, management decisions are contingent on our historical understanding of the system. Um, and, and we think the historical understanding of the system isn't very good. Uh, so we're trying to add to that. Okay, I'm moving on now to Egypt. <laughs> um, this is a, a beautiful palette um, at the Ashmolean Museum uh, of, uh, that's dated to the pre-dynastic era in Egypt. And what it shows is among some mythical organisms, uh, there's many, many modern species that are no longer in Egypt. Uh, so it's a portrait of the past, where the past is very different than the present. And Egypt in the pre-dynastic era, era uh, was a very different place. And our goal here is to reconstruct the patterns of extinction, to understand what Egypt looked like before, and use that to inform how Egypt operates today. And this is common. Uh, we have bared witnesses. Oops. Uh, sorry as I hit the table, uh, we have bared witness to these changes as humans, and we've documented these changes in many different places. Um, this is uh, 
this is a, a cave in Spain in and in a pictograph of a bison. Of course, there's uh, cave paintings all over Europe and many other parts of the world uh, documenting organisms that no longer live where they live. Um, sometimes organisms that are extinct. And um, that's in the relatively short history of our being on the planet. Uh, the world has changed quite a bit and we've, we've likely played a role in it, not always. And, and sometimes there's natural climate change uh, reasons as well, but we've certainly played a role. Uh, this is another um, beautiful picture, uh, the lion panel uh, in a cave in France, I believe. Uh, I've not had the opportunity to see it in person, although many of you might have. Um, but it's just incredible, the, not only just the, the images that are, the, art, the artistry and the images, but they almost depict motion. Uh, and it's actually been thought that multiple pictures like this of, of lions next to each other were kind of a, a cartoon uh, used to, to illustrate motion. Oh yeah, I wanted to delete that. Okay, so I'm just gonna skip, go a little faster here. Okay, so the goal here is to use paleontological and historical information to reconstruct the pattern of extinctions in a single community over millennial time scales. And specifically, we wanna ask, what have been the cumulative dynamic effects of climate, urbanization, and industrialization on mammalian communities? And can this inform our understanding of how communities operate today? Um, now, I wanna be really explicit in saying that I'm not trying to say what caused the changes that will be that I'll be presenting. Um, the causation is a different problem. Uh, really, we're looking here at the consequence, reconstructing what those changes are and looking at the consequences of them. So let me just introduce you very briefly to the area. Um, we're looking at the Nile Valley uh, in Egypt. This is how it looks today. And I, I just love this description of the area. Uh, desert vegetation can be classified into three basic subdivisions uh, based on how much water those areas receive, perennial, ephemeral, and accidental. It's a very dry area. Um, and, and water really drives everything. And if we look in, in Egypt today, these are some of the species we might be lucky enough to see. We have the black-back jackal, uh, Canosaurus, um, or the golden jackal, sorry. Uh, hyena, hyena, the striped hyena, uh, caracals, these really cute uh, small cats, um, uh, foxes. Uh, and if we were to go back in time, we would have seen other organisms as well. We would have seen leopards, we would have seen cheetah. Uh, these organisms are no longer there. Uh, the last individuals were uh, killed relatively recently, although their populations collapsed a long time ago. Um, the last leopard was observed in 1913. The last cheetah was uh, killed in 1974 near El Magra. Uh, if we look at herbivore species, we see, of course, a little more uh, diversity. We see uh, the wild ass, we see uh, cat, ibex, gazelle, many multiple species of gazelle, uh, many of which are, are red listed. Um, and then we look at those that are not long, no longer there. Uh, the heart of beast was last observed in 1935. Uh, the Egyptian boar, uh, the last specimen in Egypt was uh, British specimen number 2450, um, 1912, uh, Attic's. Uh, 1957, and um, Oryx, oops, at the bottom, uh, disappeared in the last half, first half of the 19th century. Um, however, if we look farther back, uh, humans, um, keen observers of the natural world that we are, have been uh, recording our observations for a long period of time. So our goal here is to not only integrate paleontological information of species occurrences, but integrate artistic representations of species occurrences as they have been depicted in Egyptian artwork um, over, over time. Uh, and because Egyptian antiquity is so well documented and dated, uh, dating artwork um, and the presence of organisms is, in artwork is relatively uh, straightforward. Um, and so the idea is to use these representations, many of which are in ecological settings. Uh, so, you know, pictured here is, is the enjoyments of hunting. And we see, uh, well, <laughs> herbivores being hunted by dogs, um, but herbivores in their natural environment being hunted by Egyptians. And uh, what we're going to capitalize on it are these ecological depict depictions of organisms rather than uh, religious iconography. Here's again uh, a, a beautiful uh, pictograph of, uh, from the tomb of Amenemhat in Dynasty uh, 12. 
uh, picturing many different species of, of herbivores being hunted with a net, uh, which was a common way of, of, of you know, you surround an area with a net and then, and then hunt them at ease. Uh, Hartebeest, Dorcas gazelle, leopards, oryx, fox, cheetah, uh, roan antelope. So just incredible diversity, uh, most of which are not currently in Egypt today. Uh, again, here's here's a couple different um, pictures just to show you the diversity of uh, in, in natural history in some of these depictions. We have bird hunting on the upper left, um, and and the nets that are they traps that they they used in the upper right, and then the fish diversity on the bottom is also really uh, kind of astounding. I don't know fish very well, but I would bet a lot of these fish could be identified uh, pretty well from these pictures. Now, one of the other uh, important things about Egyptian uh, artistry is that they were uh, very focused on documenting. They documented a lot of details and they clearly distinguished organisms that were domesticated and imports uh, from other places that might have been captured and paid in tribute uh, to a pharaoh or, or whatever was going on. And this is the symbol on the bottom that symbolized uh, domesticated organism. It's pronounced ren and it means fat, fattened. Uh, and, and they use this to distinguish between wild and domesticated uh, stock. So just a really quick and really brief um, uh, history lesson on, on the uh, Egyptian past and what, we're, what I really wanna focus on, uh, which is the climate change. So um, 15,000 years before present, we have the oldest known artwork um, out in the desert. And, and I'm picture, showing that picture on the, on the sides of these uh, rock uh, cliffs. Now, 5,000 years before present was the end of the African humid period. So before that period in time, Egypt was like East Africa. It was um, wet, it was a savanna woodland, and it had all of the organisms that we associate with savanna woodlands, which I'll show in a moment. Uh, but at around 5,000 years before present, the monsoon shifted and the rain stopped falling on the area and it, became, uh, it, it began its desertification process. Of course, that had nothing to do with humans. Um, Five, or sorry, 4,580 years before present, we have the establishment of the Old Kingdom. Uh, 4,140 years before present, we have the establishment of the Intermediate Period, along with a large aridification event, which I'm showing with the orange dots, by the way. Um, and this aridification event was an important one. It's noted, it's discussed in tablets um, and pictograms, and it's been linked to, uh, this aridification event has been uh, linked to large political upheaval and um, quick su successions of rulers. Um, and, it, and it's thought that that quick succession of rulers was brought about by large famines uh, from the aridification. Uh, 3,270 years ago was the establishment of the new kingdom. And then 3,000 years before present was another large aridification event that's documented um, in the records as well as um, uh, sediment cores now, we can confirm a lot of these, these aridification events. And then more recent history with the Greco-Roman um, description of Egypt and, and of course, more recent industrialization. Okay, that was a very quick history of Egypt. Just to show you some um, early, early Holocene uh, rock art from the Egypt area, uh, we have uh, elephants described, elephants depicted up here. So we don't usually associate elephants with Egypt. They were there. Uh, giraffes were in Egypt. Um, the Damadir was likely a recent migrant from Mesopotamia uh, and just a whole suite of organisms that we don't think about living in Egypt today because they don't. And if you go through and categorize all of the different um, species that are present both in archeological or paleontological deposits as well as those represented in ecological settings, um, this is the list that you have. You have uh, cob, wildebeest, hartebeest, oryx, uh, camels, um, uh, deer, dama deer, uh, giraffes, hippos, uh, <laughs> you know, just everything we associate with the Serengeti uh, was in Egypt. In terms of the carnivores, we had um, striped hyenas, spotted hyenas, uh, cheetahs, leopards, uh, two distinct species or subspecies of lion, a short-maned lion and a long-maned lion. And I'll get to that in a, in a minute. And that was distinguished apart from being male and female. Um, and there's well, I'll get to it. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. But if we go through time and document when these organisms disappear uh, from 
the, um, these, these ecological depictions uh, and from, from, from deposits, uh, we can build a pattern of extinctions. And we can put error on that too, to account for uh, organisms being um, you know, depicted after they've gone. Right, and so what I'm showing here is uh, the the first appearance, and and for some organisms, but primarily the last appearance of these different species, which is the black circle, uh, and then the red, the color that's overlain on top, is the probability of extinction. So where we have a last appearance, we we ha we have a, a gradually declining, sorry, gradually increasing probability of extinction uh, following their last appearance. Okay. And so it's a very particular pattern. And so that is what we used to infer changes in food web uh, structure over time. Now I mentioned that there's two subspecies of lion, a large bodied long maned lion. I gotta keep an eye on the time because I get trapped in uh, Egypt stories here. Uh, a large bodied long maned lion and a smaller bodied short maned lion. And these were represented as two distinct uh, subspecies within, within the artwork and descriptions. And this actually correlates with, with a known lion population that was last uh, seen in the, in the Atlas Mountains. Um, so we think this might, this might represent the Barbary lion, um, which was a larger bodied, longer maned lion uh, that existed in North Africa until relatively recently. There's still stories of, of relict populations surviving in the Atlas Mountains, um, but it really disappeared at the end of the second dynasty in terms of its representation in the artwork. And then of course the short maned lion um, lasted much longer. So it didn't disappear from Egypt until the end of the, in, until around 3000, uh, 35 years before present, actually cor correlating with it with an aridification event. Okay, so one way that we can depict structure over time before we even begin to reconstruct interactions is to just simply look at the predator to prey ratio. So what we see over time, and I would also draw attention to the fact that these time bends are not equally sized, okay? Um, they, they really correspond to the information that becomes present due to different dynastic cycles beginning or ending uh, in, in antiquity. Um, <clears throat> but if we look at the predator prey ratio over time, we see that it's increasing until about 3000 uh, years before present as um, herbivores uh, disappear. So herbivore species, uh, are disappearing first, increasing the predator-prey ratio, after which it decreases at around 3,000 years before present, uh, and then increases again. Of course, as the system becomes, uh, as it loses species, it becomes much more volatile. The predator-prey ratio becomes more volatile because smaller changes make larger differences in the ratio. Um, but I'd like to draw your attention to three uh, larger shifts that we see in the predator-prey ratio, at least historically. Um, and that's outlined by these stippled lines. And those correspond to the three large aridification events. Um, so it would seem in a very correlative way that um, aridification events uh, appear to have impacted how this, uh, the structure of the community may have been changing over time. And again, I'm not really drawing uh, causation to this. Uh, there's many different causes that we could imagine could feed into this. And this might be you know, room for theory in the future. Um, it could be driven by bottom-up forcing. It could just be driven by you know, changes to the environment um, as, as, as directed by changes to the climate, uh, which I'm showing on the right. Or it could, or humans could play a large role. Um, we could play a role by competing uh, for uh, space, really, you know, in this area, as it becomes more and more desertified, uh, water is the key. And in, in finding habitat where you have access to water is, is really the limiting resource in these systems. So as humans begin to expand their agricultural base, uh, they're taking up space where water is available um, and that's pushing out wild animals. And, and this could certainly have led uh, to um, many of the ext extinctions that we observe uh, in the record. Or humans could have actively been hunting these organisms. Uh, and, and had a large impact, especially as we have the establishment of a relatively sedentary uh, human civilization for one of the first times, um, they, that, that, that where they're also subsisting on crops uh, for food, they could have an abnormally large impact on, on populations of wild organisms. Okay, 
Now, I'm not going to go through this because I already did, um, but we use body mass information because all of these species are, are extant. Uh, so we know the sizes of these organisms and from their body sizes, we can reconstruct the probability of a link existing between them and then build series of food webs uh, that we think best represent um, these systems. Dynamics. Okay, so this is kind of the fun part. Um, and, and I know you guys have had awesome talks about dynamics so far. Um, this is our, this is, we, we wanted to not only reconstruct food webs, but say something about the stability of those systems. And we wanted to see how uh, stability or, or measures of stability might have changed over time. Uh, to do this, we used an approach called generalized modeling. And I've got a couple key citations on the bottom. Uh, this was really pioneered by uh, Tilo Gross in uh, 2006 and later in uh, 2009 with a, um, and then we have a description really focused on ecological systems uh, and theoretical ecology in 2011. Um, and I've been meaning, I, yeah, I'll, I'll try to make a reference list for all of these things that I'm citing and not doing a very good job of reporting what journal they're in, but I'll, I'll make a reference list for all of the different things uh, that I'm talking about for those of you who are interested uh, that I can make available. Um, okay, generalized modeling. So, uh, you know, this is really useful where we know the architecture of the dynamics of the system, but we don't know the functional relationships that um, that are embedded within that architecture. So for example, let's consider an ecological system where we have the change in biomass over time. So B is biomass and we have some function of growth. So we have a source, right? So there's biomass is growing by the function S and it's draining where there's a function of mortality as this function D. Um, but we don't know the specific nature of these functional forms. Uh, this actually might better represent our knowledge of the system. Um, but, and, and this is particularly true for past systems where we really don't expect to know the exact architecture of the system, or at least we don't want to assume that we know. The problem is, of course, we can't simulate a system like this and we can't solve for its fixed point or steady state. So what can we do with it? We can do quite a bit actually. Um, we, first, uh, the method very simply and generally and quickly uh, is, is to establish B star as a, vari as a variable representing all internal equilibria of the system. So these are all non-negative, non-zero equilibria that represent uh, you know, states where, where all of the organisms persist uh, in, in our system. Okay, but it's unknown because we don't know the functions. We can then define a new set of parameter, parameters representing the normalized variables of the generalized system. So here we're defining little b as the biomass divided by the biomass at steady state, which is unknown. A little s of little b is the is the the growth function of the biomass divided by the growth function of biomass at the steady state, and little d of little b is the mortality function divided by the mortality of the biomass at steady state. Uh, the important thing about all of these uh, new parameters, these normalized parameters, is that steady state they're all equal to one, and that helps us a lot. This allows us, this normalization procedure of the, of the generalized system allows us to extrapolate biologically meaningful, and this is the key, biologically meaningful and relatable um, uh, coefficients, terms, variables, et cetera. So here we see that when we set the system equal, so when we set the normalized system uh, equal to zero, right? So, so assess the system at steady state, uh, little s of b and little d of b, I'm getting covered up here. Uh, so this term and this term become one. And we have this simple relationship of S star over B star, which is just a constant, is equal to D star over B star, another constant. And we'll just define this as the turnover rate at a steady state. So this, um, this gamma here is directly biologically meaningful. It is the biomass turnover rate at steady state. And it's equal to the normalized function of growth minus the normalized function of mortality. Okay, so we've generalized, we've taken this general system and we've normalized it, okay? Um, now we want, and then we've redefined uh, some of the uh, constants in the system uh, to be biologically meaningful. But now we want to assess the system's stability and what's our, what's our interpretation of, what can be our interpretation of this? So we're gonna perturb it and we're going to look at the, uh, 
conduct linear stability analysis as we would to any other uh, ODE system that we might investigate. So we're gonna look at the change in uh, d little b over dt as a function of little b, um, with sorry, with respect to little b. And this equals the single eigenvalue of the system. And uh, we simply take uh, the, uh, the, the derivatives with respect to little b across uh, the different elements of the system. So um, we end up with this uh, derivative, for example, for the growth function, for the normalized growth function, with respect to the normalized uh, biomass, is equal to uh, the derivative of the log of the unnormalized growth function divided by the derivative of the log of the unnormalized biomass evaluated at the steady state. And this actually has a, a direct uh, biological interpretation. It is the percent change in growth divided by the percent change in the argument in, in the unnormalized biomass. It's a functional elasticity. Um, so functional elasticities in this system are the logarithmic derivatives of the unnormalized functions relative to the unnormalized argument. And this provides a nonlinear measure for the sensitivity of the function to variations in biomass. So we have in this very simple 1D system, we have the single eigenvalue of the system equal to the biomass turnover rate times the elasticity of growth minus the elasticity of mortality. And we can directly relate this to the conditions under which this uh, single eigenvalue is going to be greater than zero or lesser than zero uh, as a function of the values of the elasticities of growth, the elasticities of mortality and the biomass turnover rate, which uh, doesn't matter so much as in, in terms of determining the, the positive negative uh, value of the eigenvalue. Okay, so one of the important messages here is that, or, or why are we doing this, uh, is that elasticities characterize whole families of functional forms. So consider uh, power law functions. Uh, we have a function where, the, where it's constant, a function with a, with a linear power, um, uh, a function with a square term. And if we take the uh, elasticities of these functions, we see that the constant term is simply zero, the linear term is one, and the squared term uh, is, is two. So uh, power law functions have uh, direct uh, single values associated with their elasticities, with their functional elasticities. And this allows us to set realistic bounds uh, to the elasticities in the Jacobian, if we're talking about a, a, a multidimensional ODE system, um, that, that go into the uh, Jacobian. So you'll have a Jacobian matrix that you derive to, to look at the linear stability of the system. Uh, that's a function of all of these elasticities uh, from the generalized model. Uh, but the elasticities themselves have realist, have very small bounds associated with them uh, to be biologically meaningful. Um, and that really sets a lot of constraints into the system. So you can more efficiently search across uh, you know, com combinations of parameters uh, that are biologically realistic um, and, and get a better sense of what the stability of biologically realistic systems is given the architecture fed into the generalized model. Uh, more complex functions have elasticities that are functions of the unknown steady state, uh, but also range between small, uh, small ranges of values. So for example, an elasticity that's more complex that might be a function of the unknown steady state may only realistically be able to vary between zero and one or between one and two. And this really sets a lots of constraints uh, that enable, enables us to more effectively search biologically reasonable uh, space. So just to kind of depict this as a cartoon, if we're doing a random matrix type of approach, we have a large parameter space to search across to get a sense of the stability of the system. However, the generalized modeling approach allows us to subdivide this large parameter space uh, to biologically meaningful units so we can more efficiently uh, search across the system um, and, and ignore parameter combinations that are biologically unrealistic. Okay, so now that we've done this, um, we have, oh yeah. So we have, uh, I'm pointing at my screen again. We have a large uh, system of many interacting species. And we have, uh, so change in the uh, abundance of species I over time is equal to the growth of I if it's an herbivore, uh, plus the growth of I if it's a carnivore and consuming many other herbivores. 
uh, minus the mortality of species I, if it's a carnivore, or minus the predative, predative loss uh, if it's an herbivore. We normalize that system to a steady state. So this is just kind of the, the higher dimensional version of what I've already shown you, but all of the principles are the same. And then we can derive uh, the Jacobian matrix. So we can drive, derive the uh, on-diagonal and off-diagonal elements of the Jacobian matrix, which are now all functions of the functional elasticities, um, each of which has uh, relatively constrained ranges. And so now we can search across many different potential Jacobians uh, by randomly drawing from within those ranges to determine a percent of those systems that are stable relative to a percent that are unstable. And this allows us to translate the structure that we've reconstructed from the body mass ratios uh, to the likely dynamics of the system and do so for all of the different snapshots that we have of Egypt in the past as it changes over time. So we are um, really going to look at three different measures here. We're gonna look at food web stability, which is just the percentage of uh, drawn food webs that are stable out of the large number that we simulate. Um, I, think, I think we simulate around 10 to the seventh. Um, and so this gives us a sense, again, of just the general stability of the entire system. Um, is the system stable, right? And that's just what percentage of those uh, systems, those drawn systems, those Jacobians that we draw from the functional elasticities uh, have, a, have a leading eigenvalue that's less than zero. Um, secondly, we wanted to assess the species specific roles and sensitivities to change. Okay, so um, let's see. Yeah, so we did two things which I'll describe in the next slide. So one is related to the stability of the system and that is once we have the stability of the system, then we can start pulling out species and determining whether or not that stability increases or decreases with the absence of a given species. So for example, if 90% of our food webs that we draw are stable, and then I pull out lions, and now 95% are, well then that, that means that lions are a destabilizing force in that system. Okay, if we have a system that's 90% stable and I pull out gazelles and suddenly there's 10% that are stable, then that would mean that gazelles are an incredibly stabilizing force in that system. Uh, so that's something that we're gonna look at. We're gonna look at the change in the percent of stable food webs relative to different species being present or absent in the system. The third thing that we're gonna look at, I don't even know if I have a three on here, I should. Do I? No, I don't. Okay, the third thing uh, that we're going to look at is the sensitivity of species uh, to a perturbation, to a different type of perturbation. So we're going to use this idea of a press perturbation where we push the system to a different equilibrium, to a different steady state, and examine uh, how each of those species that are in the system respond to that push. And this is given by the equation in the bottom right, and it's a function of both the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues uh, in the system where we sum across the modes uh, to get the, the stability, or sorry, the sensitivity of each individual species in the system. Sorry, I'm going through this really quickly. Uh, we explain it more slowly in the paper. <laughs> I guess as slow as you'd like to read it. Um, so what are our results? Um, what were the dynamic consequences of community change over time? So on the, on the y-axis is the proportion of stable food webs uh, with 100% at the top. And on the x-axis, we have our time bins. And so we look at each system and simulate uh, many different iterations of its uh, structure, as well as, as the potential dynamics that can go onto that structure. And what we see um, very straightforwardly is over time, uh, the system becomes less stable. And this is true whether we apply tons of uncertainty into the disappearance of species. So, you know, upwards of, you know, plus or minus 200 years, plus or minus 500 years to the disappearance of species uh, from the, the, you know, both the artwork and the paleontological information, archeological information, it doesn't change the overall picture of, of what occurs as species go extinct. So the Egyptian system uh, at the end of the Pleistocene, we can interpret as being much more stable as it is today, um, as it has fallen apart and unraveled over the course of the Holocene. Perhaps a little more interestingly, um, we, we can 
evaluate the stabilizing effects of different species in the system. So again, on the x-axis, I have the time bends. Um, and here we're trying to determine whether there are key species that contribute to the stability of the system, um, in which case, if they're lost, they are um, uh, contributing destabilizing forces into the food web. Now on the y-axis, we have the change in the percentage of stable food webs with or without a given species. And each line, each trajectory represents uh, a comparison of the presence or absence of different species. Um, and I've illustrated some of the species. It turns out all of the herbivores are stabilizing. So, um, and, and meaning that their trajectories are gonna be above zero because they have a net positive uh, uh, contribution to the stability of the food web, uh, whereas carnivores tend to be destabilizing. Um, and what we find is that the most stabilizing species are the smaller bodied herbivores. And as we've lost the redundancy of smaller bodied herbivores over time, uh, their stabilizing effect of the, on, on the system has increased, which means the um, consequence of losing them has become larger as well. We can see farther back in time, losing any species has very small effect on the stability of the system. Uh, whereas today, because there's so few organisms left in the system, losing any species for the most part has a much larger effect, but it's the smaller bodied herbivores that have the largest effect because they're shared by so many carnivores. Because the carnivore species rely on those herbivores, losing them is losing, losing the core of the system. And the last result that I'd like to share with you has to do with the sensitivity. Um, does sensitivity predict persistence? I mentioned yesterday uh, that one of the keys about paleo ecology is that we know the future <laughs> when we look into the past. We know the future when we look into the past. So we can evaluate um, whether uh, species that we think might be likely to be important uh, have large effects on the system. Or perhaps we can consider whether species that appear to be more sensitive based on some theoretical argument actually go extinct. So here we're calculating the sensitivity of species to a perturbation. In other words, we're pushing the system to a new equilibrium and seeing you know, how, how, um, how different species react, how sensitive are they to that disturbance. And we could postulate then that species that are more sensitive to a disturbance may be more likely to go extinct. In other words, species that are more, more sensitive to a disturbance uh, may persist for a smaller amount of time in the system. And because we know the persistence of species, how long they are in the system after the end of the Pleistocene, that's what we have on the y-axis. We have how long the species are in the system after the Pleistocene, it's logged. Uh, and then we have the log sensitivity on the x-axis. And what we find is a, is a negative relationship. Um, so species that are more sensitive have shorter persistence times in the system, whereas species that are less sensitive have longer uh, persistence times in the system. And there's this kind of roof here, the ceiling, uh, because that's the maximum amount of time since the end of the, uh, since, since we, uh, sorry, since we began making the record. So at the end of the Pleistocene until now, this is kind of the maximum. Th these species are still present in the system and these species have been lost. So what have we found? We found in Egypt, as the system has unraveled in the presence of all of the changes that have gone on uh, in Egypt, both climate, human-induced, everything added together, uh, we found that with the unraveling of the food web has come decline in stability. And that there are key species that have played in a larger role um, than others in determining whether uh, that stability is eroded or not. And finally, the sensitivity of these species, which is again a consequence of their structural relationship within the food web, um, as, as well as the elasticities that we attribute to them uh, through this generalized modeling perspective, that, that the more sensitive species are, uh, the less likely, the less length of time they are expected to remain in the system. So um, persistence in this case is, is predictable. Okay, so moving on into the future, right? Um, we, we think these community level frameworks are vital for understanding how our ecosystems uh, are, are expected to change um, in, in the face of these traumatic events 
uh, that they witness over long periods of time. And of course, you know, we've looked into the, into the past at mass extinctions in the past, um, and we've seen large changes in food web structure and function um, on either side of extinctions. And today it's important to note, um, not to end on too sour of a note anyway, but that, that we're in the sixth mass extinction. All evidence points to the fact that we are in the sixth mass extinction. Um, and so building upon uh, paleontological insight, I think, in my perspective, is vital, absolutely vital uh, for having a sense of what to expect in the future. Um, yeah, so if there's any time, uh, I'm, I'm happy to take uh, questions. And then we'll, on Thursday, I'll, I'll really switch gears and, and take a much more uh, a close uh, view of how energetic uh, constraints can give us insight into uh, systems that are, that are um, no longer around, that are extinct. So thanks so much. Thank you so much, Justin, for the very nice lecture. So yeah, I'm sure there is a bit of time for questions. So if anybody has any question, you can either raise your hand or write it in the chat as usual. I guess everybody is a bit tired after many hours of lectures. Anyway, Justin will give another lecture on uh, Thursday, if I'm not wrong. So if uh, you get any questions later, you can always ask them on, on Thursday. Great. Sounds great. Well, thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. Oh, actually, there was, oh, sorry, there were raised hands. I didn't see them. Oh. Um, sorry. So um, uh, there's a question from Flavia. Hey, Justin, how are you? <laughs> Good. Hi, Flavia. How are you? <laughs> Very nice talk. Congratulations. Thank you for thank that. You. Um, I'm curious with uh, one result you presented, you show that the small herbivores are more or less the keystone species. And this is a little bit contradictory. I don't know how to say that, but it's like the opposite of the expected in theory, uh, usually we think that large mammals are large predators are those that are the keystone species. Is it, is your result uh, a consequence of the dynamics or a consequence of the biomass approach that you use? What, what is that? Yeah, you know, I think, I think, and I, I wouldn't necessarily say they're keystone species because that's assuming, um, you know, some kind of sta stabilization relative to their known abundances. Um, but yeah, they're they're key to stability. But they're, but I would say they're only key to stability in the systems that we were looking at recently. So it's only after the systems are unraveled that they really become that important. Um, but if you look at a fully fledged system, so if you go back to the end of the Pleistocene, which is very Serengeti-like, um, they, you know, it. it, it there really aren't any species that make a large, uh, that have a large impact on stability when they fall out. Um, and so I guess I would argue that that is an artifact of the unraveled state of the system. Um, and that perhaps uh, only very disturbed systems will um, observe that importance for the smaller bodied herbivore. Um, but, you know, even in these large systems, and, and I think that's because of redundancy. You know, if you look at that, uh, that mortality graph by, in that Sinclair paper showing that sigmoidal relationship to the probability of preda uh, predative mortality, the smaller animals are getting hammered, but there's a lot of them. And so if one goes extinct, you know, I can't find a, a topi, I'll go after a Thompson's gazelle. Um, but if there are no, if there's only Thompson's gazelle, uh, then, then I think that would be a very different situation. Okay, I see. Thank you. <laughs> okay, there is another question from, from uh, Matteo. Hi, yes, just a curiosity. Um, just uh, to, to what extent uh, you can think uh, the sixth uh, mass extinction is similar to to the others because essentially it looks like uh, there is a factor which is the prevalence of humans which is uh, 
might be different from 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 the other extinctions yeah that's a really good question um and i'll be waiting and i guess to answer that i'll wait into things i don't know a ton about <laughs> um it, because a lot of people are working on this right just just determining whether or not we're actually in a mass extinction which uh has a lot to do with figuring out extinction rates and projecting into the future into into a very unknown future i guess if anything i would think that um the uh the the rate of the extinctions that we're experiencing today is probably a lot faster um, than the rate of extinctions experienced in the past, which are kind of unknowable. You know, the Permian Triassic, Permo Triassic mass extinction uh, likely occurred over hundreds of millions of years, or sorry, not hundreds of millions of years, uh, uh, you know, millions of years, um, or hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, and because it was this kind of gradual change to the climate brought on by these massive um, uh, volcanic events. Um, the KT extinction uh, might have been a lot faster, the asteroid impact, but you know we don't really know how the extinction rates changed for different taxa afterwards. Um, but it, but it, you know, we've had a huge impact on a relatively short time scale. Um, and, and I would say, if anything's different, it, it's, it's, it's faster. We're, we're more efficient um, than, than volcanoes. Uh, so in terms of, you know, contributing to extinctions. So that would be my guess. But um, I know a lot of people are working on, on trying to understand how the current mass extinction, if it is a mass extinction, and it does seem like it is, um, compares to prior extinction events. Thanks. Okay, I still see the raised hand of Flavia. I don't know if she has another question or if she didn't unraise her hand. Okay, it was not a question. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't see any other raised hand. So if nobody has any other question or if I am not, uh, not seeing them like before, <laughs> I think we can say Thank you again to Justin and uh, hear you again on um, on Thursday. On and Thursday. Sounds great. Have a nice uh, evening. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you guys have had a long day, but my day is just beginning. So <laughs> right. that's so why I have energy. Have a, have a good day to you then and to all the other people <laughs> on the other side of the world. <laughs> that's right. Thank you so much.